welcome to the uh, GSA annual anniversary. <laughs> yeah, nice. Please take feel free to take your tea or coffee, depending on which time of the day you are at the moment. But did you make yourself uh, cozy and comfortable first? And also, uh, ideally, it would be nice to put your location also aside from your name. Uh, I'm from Germany, currently live in the area of uh, Stuttgart. So that's give us a better view of uh, where you guys are dialing from at the moment. Well, I fly a Swiss flag in the background. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Oh, you can put, I'm just a world citizen, no matter where I'm living. I'm There's a UN flag as well, so that, that's both. That's true. Hello, Christine. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Hello. Paulina, nice to hear from you from the Netherlands. Okay, I will give another minute uh, for people to come in, um, just in respect of the time. Uh, so we won't wait for too long for other people to join. I think I know most of the, most of you. <laughs> Hello, Darren. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. Hello. Where are you from? Calling in from Calgary, Canada. Ah, lovely. <laughs> yeah, feel free to put where you're coming from, uh, aside from your name, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, I would suggest that we, uh, we start. I'm sure people will join in later, um, but first uh, uh, warmly welcome uh, for the uh, annual summary and celebration of a global system accounting. Um, and remembering uh, more than a year ago um, from EBBF, um, community we started at this initiative uh, led by Arthur, Sarah, and a couple of you uh, here, uh, which I won't name each one of you, um, to jointly um, co-hosting and uh, the initiative. And, and this group has been growing and moving and flowing um, very actively over more than a year now, I think. Uh, so we have reached also um, quite a few um, very impressive uh, milestones. And um, in the middle of last year, for example, uh, we also presented the group results uh, in the um, um, one of the most um, renowned uh, international um, environmental forums. And also this group has been also restructuring and attracting new souls and uh, consolidated efforts uh, for push this initiative further. So I'm very happy to uh, welcome all of you to join today and also to take a look and flashback um, for the results and the GSE has reached, um, um, reached so far and um, briefly introducing also some of the um, collaborators today here. Uh, Johan, uh, maybe you can give a hands shake uh, here to all of us. And he will be helping us for the technical uh, side of this event. And for any uh, technical issues, you can also PM him. 
I'm also, chat. unfortunately, I will be the timekeeper. So if you hear my name often, it's because we're running out of time. So I'll put it in the chat and we'll notice it. Yeah. And uh, so me, I will be doing um, the transition hosting uh, for the conversations and hopefully it can facilitate uh, this event also for you guys to have more inspir inspirations of the dialogues coming out of uh, this discussion. Okay, so that's the main uh, background works that we are uh, having at the moment. So firstly, maybe Johan, uh, could you post the, briefly the agenda um, that we suggested for today in the chat? And this um, today's event will be scheduled into three parts. So the first part, we will uh, invite uh, the initiator, Arthur, Arthur Dahl, to give us a, about an overview of GSA uh, over the year, and also um, some of the highlights and milestone that we have achieved. And afterwards, uh, we will have about 10 minutes for questions and discussions. Um, for this year of efforts, um, please feel free to, to raise your hand or put your thoughts in the chat or try to consolidate that into, um, into discussions. Afterwards, uh, we'll have uh, each uh, group. So we divided the nine uh, subgroups into three major groups, social accounts, environmental accounts, um, and um, I think the other one is um, health and account. And three of them I will have about uh, five minutes for each group um, for their progress. And five minutes we will also give in to the audience and to, to share um, and also giving questions and to these three major uh, accounts. And the last but not least, uh, we will have another um briefer uh, brief look to the globe and to also other areas and communities in the world and to see how uh local community efforts has been taking place um in the last year as well to give us also more uh inspirations and overview um of many uh efforts taking from the grassroots perspective and of course we will have always room for discussions Okay, so thank you very much, Johan, for posting this beautiful agenda to the chat. And we will uh, take time also to, um, to introducing some of the links that he also posted there. Okay, so now I would love to give the stage to Arthur. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, just extremely briefly, the, the whole idea came out of the, the uh, reflections on the, the the Glasgow Climate Conference in particular and the fact that I've been working for 50 years at trying to turn the the world in a more sustainable direction and we haven't succeeded yet so I was saying well what's wrong and one of the things that struck me was the fact that our whole measure of progress has been you know GDP financial measures you know more money flowing through the system and therefore uh, as long as we think only in terms of money and what can be traded in the market, we're driven by values of greed and endless growth and things like that, that we're going the wrong direction. So I thought, well, if we started using science-based measures to, uh, you know, of what is human and environmental well-being and say, are they actually improving, that would give us a, a new set of ways of, of you know, encouraging progress in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. So based on that reflection, you know, I gave a the webinar for ADBF and people joined in and we've had working groups that I'll be reporting after a year's worth of work on the, the different areas. So you'll see more about that as we go forward in this presentation. But I also wanted to get us started by looking at the fact that we're not alone in this. And this is, this is also, there's a larger debate on this issue. And so I wanted to share with you a few of the other uh, activities that are taking place outside of what we've been doing in ADBF, the National Environment Forum. Uh, and how what we're doing here might also fit into some of those, those uh, larger areas. So as I said, we're, we're looking at the different contributions of different organizations to uh, 
of this, this kind of, of new thinking. So we're not alone in this area. And Secretary General called for it, his common agenda uh, in uh, 2021. He said, now is the time to correct a glaring blind spot in how we measure economic prosperity and progress. When profits come at the expense of people on our planet, we're left with an incomplete picture of the true cost of economic growth. As currently measured, gross domestic product GDP fails to capture the human and environmental destruction of some business activities. Secretary then called for new measures to complement GDP so that people can gain a full understanding of the impacts of business activities and how we can and must do better to support people and our planet. So this is actually at the highest level that Secretary General is calling you know, to get away from GDP. Oh, and so we're going very much you know, in, in the same direction. One example is what the UN itself has done, the San Francisco Commission, which has been working for several years on a system of environmental economic accounting, and then extended that into ecosystem accounting, which is one of the areas we've been looking at in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And they've created a whole framework organizing data about habitats and landscapes, measuring ecosystem services, tracking changes in ecosystem assets. And this is a whole example of how in one particular area of environmental well-being, the UN itself has been developing a whole set of tools to do this. This was approved then uh, you know, by the General Assembly, the Secret Commission uh, in March of 2021. So this is something that's quite recent work that un underway. And they've they look at sort of stock accounts, you know, in basic accounting, you usually have stocks and flows. So they looked at, you know, the ecosystem was said how much of ecosystem there is, and then the condition, what state is it in? So is it healthy or not healthy? And two different ways of looking at stock accounts. Then they had flow accounts. How do these produce ecosystem services, whether it be photosynthesis or soil restoration or whatever? You know, and these are all science-based accounts. But then because they also deal with all the UN system of accounting with GDP, they then also develop monetary accounts. So how do you relate those services to, to the flow and use of money in the system and then take that back to asset accounts in terms of financial measures of stocks and flows? So that's, that's their, been their approach to combine the two kinds of approaches. So this is what the UN has already been doing in one area of environmental accounting. Then we have the Human Development Report, UNDP, which just has developed this multidimensional poverty index. So looking really, We've also looked at issues of poverty and how do you measure whether people are in poverty. And so they had 10 indicators for child mortality and nutrition and health, education, use of schooling, living standards, water, sanitation, electricity, cooking, fuel, housing. So we, this is very similar to what we've been doing with the, the basic human needs accounts. So it's another area that already has indicators that have been developed to some extent. Then there's this well being economic alliance, interesting grouping of leading change makers, or civil society organizations and governments, you know, working together to say, how do we transform the economic system? And they have core needs of human beings as dignity. Everybody has enough to live in comfort, health, safety, and happiness. Nature, this is the environmental side, a restored and safe natural world for all life. Connection, so there's the social side, sense of belonging in institutions that serve the common good. Fairness, so justice, the equity issue, in all its dimensions at the heart of economic systems and the gap between the richest and the poorest is greatly reduced. And then participation, we also be involved. Prisons are, prisons are actively engaged in their communities and locally rooted economies. So this gives another kind of a general framework for what might be well-being and the difference of well-being that should be measured with some new accounting system. There's also this government part of it. Within this framework, you have the governments of Scotland and Wales, of New Zealand, Iceland and Finland, who've also joined together and you know, are developing their own well-being accounts at the national level. I'll give a couple of examples. But they also have some tips for how to make this kind of accounting work, which is very relevant to what we've been doing in our own you know, global solidarity accounting. They first using qualitative and quantitative methods to find appropriate indicators of well-being priorities noting often that well-being practice will be multidimensional or subjective, so we can't always have numbers for it. Then they support local data generation, community engagement in the selection of indicators, making clear that community members 
will be involved in the monitoring of policy. We talk very much about taking this to the community level. So here again, they show the importance of involving communities and serving what communities really want. Then you identify intuitive indicators that could be easily understood by general audience. Again, one of the successes of our little project has been people, that makes sense. We understand what this is. It's not some complicated kind of statistical thing. It really makes something that intuitively makes sense. So that's, again, the strength of this kind of, of effort. And then prioritizing indicators that directly connect these are outcomes, measuring what you really want to, what you really want to produce. What is the what is the result of well-being? Are people happier? Is nature you know, better and more productive and so on? And so directly connected to those outcomes. So these are some of the, the tips that they give for a more successful approach to this kind of indicator measurement. We have the OECD, which is the major grouping of the industrialized companies, which has their own well-being framework, where they look at current well-being with income, wealth, job quality, housing, health, knowledge of skills, and environmental quality, a subjective well-being, safety, work, life balance, social connections, civil engagement, looking at averages, inequalities, you know, top and bottom. In other words, you know, again, they have their own framework for how to look at well-being. And then resources for future well-being, different kinds of capital, natural, economic, you know, human, and social. There are other examples. I won't go into details here, but they're available in the compilation I've made. So Eurostat has quality of life indicators. There's a sustainable well-being index, a genuine progress indicator. The Club of Rome has come out recently with their Earth for All Average Well-Being Index, right, in countries in terms of well-being. There's a Wheel of Well-Being, Thriving Places Index, looking at local communities, a whole series of different things that you can explore if you're interested in going further. There's a Social Progress Index, for example, looking at basic human needs, the foundations of well-being, like access to knowledge, information communication, health and wellness. You can see opportunities for personal rights, personal freedom, inclusiveness, so again, you can see how much we have already in our areas done a lot of what everybody else also sees as necessary to measure well-being. Then, of course, the national well-being indicators. And there are several examples. I mentioned New Zealand has well-being indicators, but they also looked at an indigenous perspective. You know, the Maori are important in New Zealand. And so I'll give you an example afterwards of how they actually said, what would be a Maori view of well-being different from the Western economic view? Well, being in Vanuatu, I'll come back to that again, where a country right now actually, you know, they went out into the village, like, what do you want? What is your idea of growth and development, you know, of, of progress? What are the values important to you? And but the whole new system was just at the national level based on what people wanted in the villages. Iceland has well-being indicators. Wales has with them Scotland. There's a Bhutan gross national happiness, one of the, the earliest countries to actually throw out GDP and try something else. So Bhutan's gross national happiness looks at psychological well-being, including spirituality, you know, health, time use, education, cultural diversity and resilience, good governance, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, living standards. A whole, you know, again, this, we're not alone in this, and different countries adapting to their own cultures have found their own way forward. This is a, 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 the graphic of the Maori pathway to well-being with spirit and values, beliefs and practices at the center, the yellow area, and then relating to the natural, natural world and environment, nature is so important to their values, and then looking at society, the red area, human activities and relationships, and then leading to the principles to guide how people should work together to achieve well-being. So you have a whole different you know, values from cultural framework that also has a way of approaching well-being. Then Vanuatu, as I mentioned, I feel very close to Vanuatu. I helped them prepare for independence. I've done a lot of work there over the years. And they look at how to be more frame well-being around topics of happiness, of access, of knowledge, of health, and social resilience, incorporating their Melanesian values into the policy framework for the government. So for instance, they, this is the key indicators. Within this area, they have detailed indicators of how they measure each of these things. We see briefly, they have the nation based on traditional governance and Christian principles, underpinning their culture, bestowing life skills and knowledge to future generations, inclusive and equitable quality education with lifelong learning, a healthy population with high quality physical, mental, spiritual, and social well being, an inclusive society upholding human dignity, where the rights of all Niavato and women, youth, vulnerable groups, and the elderly are supported, protected, and promoted in legislation. A society where the rule of law is consistently upheld, access to justice, 
a dynamic public sector with good governance principles, strong institutions, delivering support expected by all their citizens. They look at the environment with adequate food and nutrition, with, with uh, increasing sustainable food production, improved household production, an economy of sustainable growth and development, low impact industries, modern technologies for future well being, a resilient nation in the face of climate change and disaster risks posed by natural man made hazards. A climate committed connection to ensuring the conservation and sustainable development for biodiversity and ecosystems. On the economy, they want a sustainable, well maintained infrastructure and services for all. They want strong rural economy to increase opportunities. And there was a lot of rural communities on the national because the rural is very important for them. And having business environment to create opportunities for entrepreneurs. They even have indicators for all the sustainable development goals. So quite a thorough view of this, and you can find the details again that I posted you know, on our website. And we'll see later in the video one example of how they you know approach this idea of community you know, development and well-being. So this is a wonderful example for us to follow. So I won't go any further here. You've already seen in the chat the links to both our work on the accounting and the IF work, and uh, some of the presentations you know, that we've made over the last you know, over the last year. Uh, and the, again, the examples of beyond GDP. So that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions or discussion, let me stop sharing just a minute. Okay, I hope that was useful. Thank you very much, Arthur. I was very exciting to see that. And also, and thanks for introduction, also the landscape that uh, in the global perspective, what other organizations are trying uh, and, and from the same perspective. Um, yeah, just be aware that I'm recording partially of this um, uh, presentation. And if you don't want to show your faces, uh, feel free also to turn your turn off your camera. Uh, but mainly, it's for the presenters. So um, the recording is just being paused, and um, so no no uh, constraints for everyone to, to open up their cameras and uh, feel free to also share your thoughts. Um, from the presentation which Arthur just gave us. Maybe I could ask Arthur's kind of a leading question, which is, Arthur, there's so many wonderful things going on in the world that complement what the GSA is doing. What do you feel is the sort of the unique value added that this group is focusing on that complements or reinforces what everybody else is doing in terms of we're all moving in that direction? Well, I think what we can see is that there, there are many parcel approaches. I mean, sometimes it's been looking at one particular sector or interest. Uh, very few of those systems go beyond, you might say, material well-being. Some consider social well-being. Almost none of them, only one or two, look at something and say spiritual well-being, the, the ethics and values behind what is well-being. And I think when you look at some of the recent research, it actually shows that it's at the spiritual level that well-being becomes most fundamental and most enduring. enduring. Uh, and most resilient also in the face of the challenges we're facing. So I think that's an area where when we draw on the, on the Baha'i inspired perspectives, we have additional values to bring into this and show how they enrich what others are doing. And we can we can borrow from some of the others, but at the same time, we, we add a, a mention of our own. That's why I featured particularly in my presentation for the, the Maori in New Zealand, where you at least have a country looking at their, another set of cultures and values and Vanuatu, which is, going down to its roots in both its Christian values and its traditional values as a basis for its system. Those are just a couple of examples, but they're very rare at the moment. And they're, they're still only at the national level. So we bring a, a, a global dimension to bringing that spiritual dimension. Thank you, Arthur, for putting Thank that you. very well, succinctly. Any other thoughts? Darren, please. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, presentation and an amazing uh, collection of uh, uh, frameworks uh, that I wasn't aware of. Um, and uh, like you say, the spiritual aspect is something that uh, people aren't willing to talk about, but uh, probably we know that many of those people would agree, but it's just not part of the discourse. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see the perspectives from Indigenous peoples, because in here in Canada, um, Indigenous people are speaking unabashedly about spirituality, 
and uh, almost creating space for that discussion. And I think I'll post here something I saw uh, recently on Facebook, uh, one of the native elders talking about uh, spirituality in the environment. Uh, we know they use that language. Um, so and, and I was wondering if there's any other insights of maybe uh, um, small points where we could start to um, engage the, the discourse of these organizations and, and broaden their perspective. Uh, um, and, and where, I mean, these are great perspectives. How, how close are they to influencing the mainstream of, uh, um, you know, the broader system? Like it was, it was great to see those examples from, from countries like Scotland, New Zealand. Um, is, is that really gonna create a momentum to, to change the whole discourse? I think you know, the challenge, of course, is that we, you know, we're not just looking at the accounting side of things. We're up against a whole materialistic economy dominated by large corporations that have basically swallowed up all of the, you know, the, the opposition to become near monopolies, if not monopolies, uh, for generating profit, which is a kind of institutionalized greed. And therefore, as long as the, they are so dominant in many part, many countries of the world, uh, we, we, the headwind, you might say, is extremely strong against anything that might talk about values or not growing so much or you know, not consuming so much. Or you know, we're challenging the very foundation of the present West materialist economic system. So it's not so. So I think the fact that we're making headway in some places in some countries that are more aware of this is already a foot in the door, so to speak. But it may, you know, it may be some time before you know we're able to build a momentum to impact some of the countries that are most trapped in the materialistic economy as it is at the moment. So you know, there's, there's no easy answer, but I think the more we can, at the community level, have, con have consultations on this and talk about these other values, and people say that this makes more sense than being good consumers, uh, we, will, we will also get a momentum from the bottom up towards change that will come as the Baha'is are doing in their own areas of, of social action and social transformation. Okay, uh, we have no, uh, still one hand raised, and then probably uh, we're gonna slowly move to another, the second part of our uh, event today. Okay, Philip, please. You're still. You're muted. You're still muted, Philip. In the same in the same vein as the question just uh, asked. There seems to be a, um, awareness at the United Nations Secretary General's uh, level of the need for change. And does that not um, stimulate the conversation at the international or global level? It, it certainly does. And in fact, in the preparations that are going ahead, because that was one part of his, our common agenda. Another part is the summit on the future to take place in 2024. <clears throat> and just the last two days, I've been involved in several planning <clears throat> sessions among civil society and, and governments, uh, both for a, a global futures uh, meeting taking place in March, uh, preparing for a, a minister meeting in September, the review of sustainable development goals, their whole series of initiatives <clears throat> going in this direction. You know, and many of them, you know, Baha'is are very actively involved in this. So yes, there is a momentum building, and as I say, it's still running into the headwinds, but it's spreading further and further and bringing in more and more partners you know, into this process. So I, th I think there's, there's a lot of encouraging things that are happening. I was just involved last weekend at a meeting in Madrid looking at what we have to change in the UN Charter to fix the government's dimension. And we had in that meeting a former president of the General Assembly, a Nobel Prize winner, you know, distinguished economists, from around the world. So there are a lot of good things happening, creative things happening to plan alternative ways forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you, Arthur, again. Uh, so now I would like to also invite three um, group re uh, representatives uh, to join for uh, the discussion and also a short presentation and progress review um, for the last year. And I'm not aware who will be presenting, but I will just say the name of the account. Uh, first, let's introduce, uh, let's welcome um, 
the group uh, from the environmental account. I'll start also recording. Yes. Okay. Lauren. You are muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, so this, um, uh, I will be presenting um, the work we've been doing in this, uh, in this group. Uh, this working group um, includes, in fact, uh, initially at the beginning of last year, we had three working groups. We had the carbon, biodiversity, and pollution working groups, um, which uh, were meeting regularly. Uh, at some point, for the sake of practical uh, practicality, we joined together these three groups and call it environmental group. Um, we had uh, a number of uh, online meetings, regular online meetings throughout the year. We had also um, uh, specific um, highlights uh, gathering, which includes the, uh, um, the meeting that took place um, in uh, Stockholm. Um, sorry, with the uh, on June uh, uh, last year for the occasion of the 50, 50th anniversary of the Stockholm UN Conference on the Environment. So this was an opportunity to share the reflection we have on this topic on uh, environmental accounting. Uh, there was also another plenary session in July organized by the EDDF, which was presenting um, this question. As I said, so carbon, uh, biodiversity and pollution, all of them are interconnected. And um, as, as Arthur mentioned, uh, when we look at the science-based accounting process, we look at natural processes, then uh, the science is quite advanced in that respect. We, there's a lot that is known in terms of which indicator is telling or how, how things are evolving. And this is very well known for the current, current knowledge of the way the climate works, the way it's very inter highly interconnected with the carbon cycle in the past and currently. And um, this also allowed science to provide a lot of enlightened information about what is the trend. And we know of course the trend is that global warming and increasing concentration of greenhouse gases due to burning, mainly burning fossil fuel, but also deforestation. All these indicators are giving us the direction of how things are going. And we look at the natural environment, the ecosystems themselves are being uh, Threatened and uh, the diversity of species is endangered. And you see here on this chart, you see critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, the number of species going in this, even into extinction is in increasing, and because they are increasingly threatened. And uh, so we see here on this slide, we see that the threats, there are a number of drivers uh, which are threatening uh, ecosystems. And uh, among these drivers, pollution is an important one. So they also are highly connected with uh, uh, the threat to ecosystems, biodiversity, and climate change itself is also. So there's a lot of uh, feedback loops, positive and negative, that are affecting the whole system, which we call the, uh, the biosphere. The biosphere connected with the, uh, uh, with the atmosphere and the lithosphere. So they're all completely interconnected. But then the connection here, we're looking at uh, what uh, the International Panel on Biodiversity has been showing the importance of all the human activities and how they affect these different various systems. So then again, there are many um, indicators that are looking at, at this. Um, so the reflection we had in this group uh, during last year was because uh, this is very similar. You see, where is the connection uh, we know that uh, the current economic system is based on GDP mainly, based on uh, values which are based on money, monetary terms, and they don't necessarily reflect natural systems according to the way they should. For example, a standing tree has less value than a tree that is cut, has less economic value. 
So the system is actually producing a destruction of the environment, the current economic system. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reflection at the international level, like Arthur mentioned, the existing um, uh, organization within the United Nations. We have the IPCC, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, with the last uh, conference in Egypt, the COP27. We have the UN uh, Convention uh, to Combat Desertification, which is affecting land use, uh, also affecting biodiversity. We have the IP, the UN Convention on Biodiversity, the last. The most recent was COP15 in Montreal, and also um, that is supported by the, all the science with ITBES. So uh, with the current economic system based on uh, growth, human keep pushing the plan planetary boundaries, which have their own limits, and we often pass these boundaries. So the question to discuss, there are many questions we've been discussing, but uh, one that is really essential is uh, what are the underlying values for human behavior at the individual community and institutional level that are affecting negatively or positively these different trends that I mentioned. So now the reflection is also for this year, and uh, we started discussing uh, the, the, uh, the reflection at the global level, where all this accounting um, at the global level, but also all the work done at the local level. And uh, what was mentioned also the advantage with, um, uh, in fact, uh, Baha'i communities and Baha'i international community is quite much involved at the global level as well, uh, with, uh, together with the International Environment Forum, the Ethical Business Building the Future, the Wilmot Institute, or for example, to name a few, also the Global Governance Forum. Um, these, um, institutions, these institutions have a contribution at the for the public discourse at the global level. But the public discourse is also uh, taking place at the local level, and uh, very often it's actually more easily leads to action at the local level. And so uh, at the local level, uh, we have many positive examples that can be shared. As Arthur mentioned, some of them, um, they are contributing to positive trends, for example, in climate change mitigation, adaptation, energy use, pollution reduction, biodiversity conservation, um, and a reduction of the Earth's footprint, con consumers' behavior, and zero, zero waste initiative, for example. So, Laurent, so, yes? yeah, I'm yes. sorry, we're, uh, we've got 20 minutes left to do two more groups, so if we can yes. so, focus up, yes. Right, move on. Yes. Uh, okay, so I don't have time to go into examples. I knew that, but I just mentioned a few examples quickly. Uh, example in coral reefs of local action in Vanuatu, local action in Vanuatu, they are called, and this example will be mentioned later. Example in community, uh, also a gardening a school project like this one here in Sarajevo. Uh, we have also example of bird watching and community action, community action on ecosystem restoration. Last year, the course I, I was taking part in there, there were 16,000 participants and um, thousands of promising projects around the world to restore ecosystems. So uh, we're going to see later these other examples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, maybe you may pause the recording a little bit. Um, Nan, can we have the other two presenters and then we can do questions? We've got 20 minutes left to, the, to do the other two uh, talks. Um, okay, we can also do that, uh, but I'm, I think might get a bit uh, <laughs> lengthy in a way if we're always presenting. Uh, maybe we can just give a little bit of room for breeze and for a little bit of uh, salt here. If anyone has any thoughts um, for one question, maybe, Arthur? I might just yeah. point out that the data is reasonably good on the environmental side. The problem is the is the accounting. You know, in the sense that you know it's profitable to pump carbon out of the ground. It's profitable to exploit biodiversity. It's profitable, you know, to avoid cleaning up pollution. Is not profitable to, to bring the carbon back down again. It's not profitable to restore nature or conserve nature. And so you know, the problem is not with the, the data itself, it's with the 
It's with the economic valuation behind it, which is why we need to have the alternative indicators and and find other and find ways of you know rewarding the good things that are done. The other the accounts open that door to a you know a, a more balanced accounting in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arthur. Uh, of course, uh, if there are more thoughts coming in, please feel free to also tap in the chat. I will come back to that uh, after the presentations as well. Okay, so now I'd like to give stage to the well-being account. Philip. Thank, thank you, Nan. Um, so basically, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I, I may share some um, documents later, but um, the uh, basically the group uh, was initially uh, three groups. It was uh, the minimum living standards, uh, food and health, which were combined into one uh, one group now. And um, we initially the the process was that we we gathered uh, relevant material on the subject matters and um, studied what could be alternative measures to gross domestic uh, product. Um, and um, eventually uh, some um, from, from that, those conversations, uh, a process developed where uh, individuals came up with a graphic and um, using uh, online tools to uh, define, define the, the issues and, and identify indicators, what were positive indicators, what were negative indicators for each of the different areas of this topic. Um, and in short, on a minimum living standards, um, the um, challenge, the extreme poverty in all its forms uh, needs to be eradicated and all basic needs uh, met, which is food, shelter, health, uh, sustainability, peace and justice, and partnerships to achieve this goal. And the ideal state is that every human being has adequate shelter, clean water, and sanitation, you know, also a source of energy and basic security. And uh, the debt in that area would be any deficiency in the ideal state. On the food accounts, uh, it should include measuring the planetary capacity, the planetary capacity to produce sufficient food for all, uh, adequate distribution to meet everyone's nutritional needs, and eliminate food waste and ensuring adequate income for farmers and fishers. The ideal, ideal state is, of course, zero hunger. All human beings are properly fed, and the debt is food waste, packaging, plastics, and so forth, industrial and chemical farming, having an environmental impact and uh, on biodiversity and degradation of the environment. And then the health side, uh, good health is essential to human well-being and contribute to, to contribute productively to society at each stage of life. The ideal state is good health as capital and the debt is that all factors that damage health are a debt. So over time, um, I think Sarah uh, De Hoff was in uh, in one of the groups and de developed a or crafted a Miro board uh, presentation of the health group indicators, um, and then developed a questionnaire. Which she, uh, from the initial questionnaire that was that was kind of formulated, she created a visual uh, presentation of the questionnaire that could be presented to communities and um, uh, further to engage in conversations and identify indicators in those communities or desires of those communities to improve their environment. Uh, this, trans this questionnaire was then translated um, in French and presented at a, a community event in uh, Switzerland. And then um, in Canada, um, and we will hear about these two projects in Canada, uh, they did a questionnaire that was presented to the community. It was found that it was too long, so they reformatted it. And uh, Nola Marion will present about that in a little while. So the 
project has shifted from identifying resources and focusing on indicators to uh, realize that uh, we need to get into community engagement at the grassroots. Of course, as Arthur talked about the high level conversations that are happening uh, internationally and, and globally, um, uh, we are uh, realizing that consultation at the community level is critical to engage change uh, from the grassroots up. And so, um, this is where we're seeing projects emerge, uh, like NOLA's project and then the one in Switzerland as well. So um, this is really where we are right now. We are at a transition point, uh, just initiating community engagement, uh, which is a new step for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Yeah, beautiful to know that all those grassroots activities are actually taking place out of the inspirations of uh, global system counting. And what will be more exciting to hear uh, Nola also give us an introduction afterwards about the uh, local community um, initiative that she is taking. Okay, any thoughts and questions? I saw Joe posted uh, a word in the chat. Although I couldn't pronounce it very properly. <laughs> Could you explain that to us? Yeah, John, you're on mute. It's a um, reference to the Hopi philosophy, Tetsuakachi, which um, loosely translates as um, cultivate the land and celebrate life. If you Google that word, you'll find some other like some uh, documentaries and things. And they had a publication for a while that looked at their philosophies. And um, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the Hopis went, went public with their prophecies in the last so many decades uh, because of the state of the world. It was um, looking like the time of fulfillment was here. So uh, I don't want to take up time for stuff that you can find on your own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other thoughts? If not, then I will take the time uh, to introduce to the next, the last account, um, social account. I think, Heis? Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, Nan. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, very briefly, I, again, I also don't have a, a presentation. The social accounts is, uh, in my view, I don't know why they gave it to an engineer to coordinate, but uh, one of the most difficult areas uh, <laughs> to assess. Uh, it includes uh, uh, the three sort of sub accounts. It's about work, including paid employment. We talk about knowledge and education. And, and last, but not, certainly not least, and, and perhaps the most challenging, spiritual, ethical capital. And how do you measure that? So we've been toying over just a, one or two sessions over the last half year to perhaps using some of Christine's work in, in asking questions that were more yes, no questions to say, well, can we develop some sort of an assessment that would quantify or, or help communities to assess their level of on the social accounts area? Are they positive? Are they negative? And, and not to and to sort of develop a, a, a matrix that does not offset the negative with some positive, and then you don't really see what's uh, happening underneath. So, but actually it's all very theoretical because it lacks of course, uh, uh, testing, practical testing. In, in, and also we're so, still sort of had some consultations and interactions about, well, these questions, you know, some of them really are don't make sense or are not worded correctly to really quantify something you know as as difficult as as a spiritual capital how do you quantify that but i i do sense that e even if the the sort of the science isn't there to exactly measure things 
there is a sense of of the in terms of the well-being of people that they can assess and we just heard other speakers earlier say about the importance of spirituality in 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 the sense of well-being that a humanity or a community has so 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 this is where we are at and and so looking actually for 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 insightful people that can help maybe craft something and then eventually also test it in communities and see where that goes. And uh, Nola of our group also will will talk some of her experience, which which have been quite insightful. So let me keep it at that and save you some minutes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, true. Uh, the social account uh, is one of the most, um, let's say, difficult to grasp as it's um, taking directly from the other perspective to view how interconnected with each other all those accounts that we've been talking about uh, through the spiritual power uh, within it. And that is a uh, paradigm shift perspective. And surely, has, um, I think you are doing a good job in also facilitating the discussions as engineering. <laughs> um, so- Arthur has his hand uh, up. I just, you know, I think, Looking at the, the, the um, Vanuatu example, uh, we see where, you know, they started with a set of, you know, of values, both the traditional indigenous and, and Christian. And they, when you look at the indicator, I couldn't present the indicators here. They're available on, you know, on, on the website, but they, they actually show how are these values expressed in actions or institutions, you know? Are there institutions that embody these values? Are there actions that are taken that are the expression of that values in practice. And I think that's probably the approach that can be taken. Well, you can't say how many grams of love you, you there or, or you whatever, or, or how many kilometers of love or whatever. You can and actually, you know, are, is, is of that value ex, you know, expressed in some way that can be measured through some kind of behaviors, some kind of institutions that, you know, in, that implement that value in some way. And so there are, you know, we can see that people are, are finding some ways to, at least sort of outline whether whether the value is there, whether it is increasing or not increasing through the way it is being expressed. So I think there's some, some possibilities there that we can take inspiration from and then say, well, what do we do with our own communities with respect to, you know, how well are these values expressed in our communities? And that's where we can have community conversations and looking at you know, social realities and consulting on this and so on. So I think I think maybe we can't put numbers on it in some precise way, but we can find ways of actually assessing where we are, where we want to go, and whether we're making progress. True. Thank you. And Ralph. Uh, just just to augment what Arthur said, um, <clears throat> if we think about uh, individual spirituality, that's something that's hidden, secret, private. But when it goes into the community setting, what you see are acts of service, for example. Um, in an institutional setting like a, a company, you might see it reflected in the way its HR policies are developed and whether it retains its staff and keeps training them and providing lifelong learning. Um, at a, a national level, you might see in government policies how nobility is supported and encouraged. Uh, all of those things stem from the notion of spiritual capital. So there are ways of doing it. The, the, the fascinating thing will be to see if we can develop a strand of thinking around that, how that will mesh with the other streams of work. Because if we're talking about people's health and well-being, and we're talking about food security and all those other things, you, the way in which those things are approached, if the foundation is one that's spiritual and ethical will be different. Uh, th that's a kind of long game. But I just wanted to support what Alpha said. Um, and, and, I, and I believe that we already have some indicators that we can pull out uh, from existing models of spiritual capital and so on. Um, and they certainly are reflected in the Baha'i faith, in Islam, in Christianity, and in the Jewish faith. I, I can't go beyond that because I haven't got the expertise or knowledge or understanding, but I'm sure we can we can unpick that some more. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Yeah, 
uh, for anyone just a, a side case uh, who are interested about spiritual capital uh, topics, and uh, maybe you can also pin Ralph and and he and Alan are also going very deep in this perspective. Um, may I say? Yes. Uh, yes, please, oh, Anna. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think um, the topic presented is very interesting and um, but for me there is a question uh, when all this summit um, discuss uh, this uh, uh, this uh, important issues uh, why for example um, I do not have um, um, access to what was discussed for example I am just a simple citizen of the world I, I am Romanian, but right now I am in France. And for example, we are going to have a local conference here about what we need. And the first thing that uh, we was about to discuss is to know each other. I mean, uh, this is the basics because we cannot do anything if we don't know each other. I think this is... Um, we cannot discuss about very uh, about a lot of high indicators, and for me at the beginning I thought that it was about accounting <laughs> because I am an accountant, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, it's very interesting because even these issues, uh, social accounting, environmental accounting, so these are all issues that we can uh, today. Um, we can today uh, uh, see um, everywhere, but there is not uh, a practical approach how to do it uh, at the grassroots. And for me, for example, and for the younger generation, I'm interesting, uh, for example, uh, how we can, uh, how I can have access of all this um, uh, research that was uh, was made. Uh, and how I can spread this in a simple language and a practical manner uh, in order that um, everyone could apply it and uh, uh, move on in the direction that we, we need for a better society. Hmm. Arthur, please. Just to respond to that. This is where we've taken this approach down to the community level and where we have some simple, simple questionnaires and tools to stimulate community conversations. How well are people developing relationships? Are they talking to each other? You know, that's a very good indicator. Are they building friendships? So you will see, we'll have some short presentations later on about this at the end of this. this there's more available on the website with some simple tools to bring this down to practical things to do at the community level. Thank you. Yes, uh, also also feel free to uh, check in also the from the EBBF Mighty Network page, which also we collaborated. Uh, so we, we summarized also the collaborators efforts over the, the months there and there you will find also like minded people uh, who are thinking and moving in the same direction as you are expecting or you're you're looking for. Uh, I hope you do have the access to the Mighty Network as well. Okay, so just uh, give respect to the time, we'd like to uh, slowly move to the third part, uh, which would be very excited to hear the examples, uh, which has been also taking place uh, all over the world. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, Nola Marion I'm from Canada. And to give us also a presentation and summary of the grassroots activity that she is uh, leading. Nala, please. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be presenting. I'm wondering if I can share my screen. Sure. I think you should be able to. Been disabled. You're being disabled. Okay. Um... I, I think I can only ask no, uh, Johan to help you with that. Okay. Um, no, da uh, Daniel, um, you have to, can you make uh, Nola a co-host? I can't do that. I'm not the host anymore. You're the host. So you're the only one who can do it. All right, just one moment. 
Anyway, I'll just start a little bit while, while we work that out. If it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, I'm part of, um, I'm in, in the province of Ontario and a small group of us that represents uh, six different rural communities in Dufferin Wellington have been coming together um, on a regular basis to look at ways to um, get community conversation going. And I just made you a co-host so you can share your yeah, screen. Now. I see that. You can share yeah. your screen. Yeah. So can you see my screen? Can everybody see my screen? Yes, very well. Okay. Now, if I play a slideshow, let me know if it, if it continues. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So the um, community solidarity conversations, we, we, we just felt that citizens needed a place to gather, to consult, to express a collective voice, to get educated, and then be able to inform our societal institutions in their decision making, and to build a strong circle of community trust. I think that's something that's been mentioned already. And these conversations can and should happen in any setting, informally or in, in homes with family, friends, small gatherings, or in a formal public space where we're the general public is invited. But we feel that if you do that, um, that there is, we suggest that there's some structure, that there's a time limit and that there's a facilitator and that you articulate shared values. And then you pick one or two themes, which we ha I have an example of cards that would generate a lot of brainstorming. So 20 minutes around each theme, then you have a facilitator that would record that, you come back and share with the group, with the big group and maybe reflect, examine assumptions and determine next steps. So the, uh, the suggested shared values that we are going with uh, came from the circles from Re reconciliation uh, and from the Baha'i faith. So that would be indigenous as well as Baha'i. So those would be the, 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 the uh, guiding principles, the sacred teachings, and these virtues that we would practice, hopefully, during the meeting and in our lives. And the other one is an acknowledgement of the universal laws of oneness, moderation, and unity. Then lastly, that it's not all going to fall on us that we have a shared responsibility uh, with our institutions, our communities, neighborhoods, families, and the individual to, to work together, that we have to strengthen these relationships to release the qualities of uh, cooperation and mutual assistance. We also felt it's important to define what is a well-being economy because that's a word that's not in the general um, conversation here so that we spend a moment to do that. And that means to value human and environmental well-being as well. And that there's a need to redefine wealth to include the sources of our wealth, the land, the water, air, our knowledge, trustworthiness and talents. And then I've got this little thing here because I don't think we think about all of these three things yet we need to to get this so we have to take into consider in, into consideration environmental well-being economic well-being and human well-being when we're looking at progress instead of just the gdp and this has been lacking and i think in our conversations and so there's a global perspective that needs to be we need to be aware at the local level what the global challenges are what's happening there and what the threats are and we have to develop a local response together with our institutions, our communities, and work together for common purpose. And so the inspiration for local action came from the, the GSA. And we really believe that the neighborhoods and communities, they're a tremendous resource. They have the tremendous potential to be change makers. This is the place where families grow, where you develop, where you thrive and become citizens, where you, and you can access, they can access their local reality and determine the best actions to make positive change. So step one, pick a few conversation starters, which I uh, will share. Step two, consult and decide on a plan of action. Step three, work as a collective to implement and reflect, adjust, plan, and repeat. And so it's about collaborating and, and it's about creating those learning cycles and building unity in your community through that. Um, I have to acknowledge that our initial um, resources that we started with came from Sarah DeHoff's work and Christine Mueller. And uh, there was a, like a vast array of topics that you can talk on and they're shown here. Like it's like a gallery of topics. 
but we felt it would be useful to split these into two categories, the ones needed for survival and the ones needed for material and spiritual progress. And I think that helps people focus because the basic needs are six things individuals require to survive, which are food, air, shelter, clothing, habitat, nature, that all falls into that, water, sleep, and movement. And so you need those to survive, but you also need those to achieve your full potential. And so there's a, uh, a sense that everybody has the right to achieve their full potential. And each item has to be of a good quality and in the appropriate measure. And for, and for example, you can't have all your food at one sitting. You have to have air all the time, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, um, we thought that that made sense in terms of putting priority on on things and it, this this ties in nicely with the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So there's your your guiding principles and the universal law of oneness and interconnectedness. Like the, every living thing needs these and searches for these, and you can't progress without them. And the other category, which I think is these are the society building pillars, and we were talking about material and spiritual progress. You need universal access to education and um, knowledge and the arts. You need the capacity, capability, and access to work. You need access to capital, both material and spiritual. And I would suggest that your spiritual capital are things like connectedness and, and feeling a sense of belonging and your networks, your supportive networks. And the support for, fam for family unit to thrive, which is the basic building block of society. You need a strong sense of unity, belonging, and a, a, a strong circle of trust in your community. You need a recognition of support for the commons, like your libraries, your parks, your natural spaces. You need access to transportation, access to energy, and absence of corruption. And we, we feel that these are the responsibility of the collective, like the family, the community, and the institutions. An institution, like an individual on their own, cannot make these things happen. We have to work together. These are the society building powers. This was the, um, after the questionnaires were found to be um, too heady, we felt it slowed things down. And uh, we, we really thought, well, we need to get people brainstorming and talking, get them together, get them talking quickly. And so this was the um, second, like our version of a, like it's almost like a virtues card. And it, on the one side of the card, it has the ideal state and the guiding principle. On the back, it has the questions. And our, our group felt that this too was too wordy and it wouldn't um, uh, bring about the kind of uh, consultation that's needed. So we've gone to this. And each, each element now is broken, broken down into a very general one-sided card. And when the people pick their topics in their, in their conversations, in their community conversations, they go off and you consult for 20 minutes. A facilitator would be there to record uh, the brainstorming. Uh, so they would pick two topics and at the end of the meeting, you come back and you share what you, what you thought about these things. So we've got these one-sided cards for everything. And I'm gonna stop at shelter because shelter uh, housing seems to be a really uh, hot topic right now. And no matter where you live, like housing, price of housing, the lack of rental. And shelter has also been identified by one of the big five banks in Canada as being, uh, we need, like they're basically telling the institutions that they need to make a lot, like 20% more affordable housing, accessible housing stock available, that it's creating such a, uh, a disruption to well being and to the economy to have people not housed properly, that there's mental health issues and that leads to all kinds of strains on systems that don't need to be there. And so this is becoming, and I can talk about this a little later, but uh, I just thought this was, it was really interesting that this is really at the forefront now. And I'll just quickly go through these. So each one has a card, the people that are at the meeting can pick one of these cards and they can, and I can tell you that people will respond to these little um, prompts. So the brains, like in the meantime, like when you're not uh, out with communities or having these conversations, we felt that it was also very important to create a presence in the community. And so we brainstormed a whole list of things that we could be doing in addition to the community conversations that we could be, and we haven't done them all, but these are some of the things that we think we could work towards. You create a volunteer squad, you gather a list of volunteers who can do what. 
a repair cafe. That's an international organization. I know that, um, and it's, it's about the reduce, reuse, recycle and teaching people how to fix things. And so you have a group, you organize a, a team of fixers and they gather uh, once or twice a year. Citizen representation on institutional committees, uh, we have started to do that right away. When we started the community conversations, we started scanning the papers and the media, looking for ways to make connections. And so uh, I'm on the uh, affordable and attainable housing committee for the township of Southgate where I live. And we just had our first meeting on, uh, on Tuesday. And this is a very new committee. It, it, it came into being last year. So it's, it's in its second year. And they, the mandate is that you have five representatives from the community or citizens on there. And it, uh, it was quite, uh, quite revealing. And because I'm in a predominantly agricultural area, it, uh, it's very clear that it became very clear that uh, the rules are different in rural areas. And these communities, these rural communities have been struggling with the housing that, and, and uh, they've been seeking and working together collaboratively, collaboratively making their own um, groupings to try to uh, brainstorm and generate ideas. They've been working together with indigenous groups to try to solve this problem and move things forward. And I, I also find it interesting that they're citing the United Nations Declaration uh, that the principle that everybody has the right to, to shelter and, and security. And they're also going to the United Nations and the examples uh, of uh, rural development and trying to find ways to develop appropriately so that they can uh, um, meet the needs of, of these areas that are experiencing pressures from, uh, you know, people buying like a lot of maybe 25% of a housing stock would be just for Airbnb. So non-existent uh, owners and not available for people to have. And no law. Also Sorry, no law. Okay, I'm done. I, and I just also, there's home visits okay. that we have started and community gardens and the indigenous connections we have started and uh, access to at, at risk uh, youth with, through junior youth programs. So I am done. <laughs> I will stop my share Give the prompt. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's very <laughs> wonderful. And we just want to allow a couple of questions and then we still have uh, one more presentation. Yeah. yeah, we're so sorry to cut you off. And Not we'd love to have your presentation also be shared if it, that's okay for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To this round. Yes, because it was very rich. Food. Please. Okay, Christine. Just quick question, Nola. This was so wonderful. Would you be able to write this up for the IEF website? It would be really wonderful if we had a little bit more like details Absolutely. in certain areas. Uh, it doesn't have to be too lengthy, but a little bit more in depth than what you were able in a short period of time um, to present today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will send it to you, Christine. Okay, to right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, just one question also from the audiences in the chat, uh, thank you from Darren, and he was asking, uh, what was the source of the universal law of oneness that you, you, um, you quoted over there? Well, you know, it is, it does come from Baha'u'llah, but it also, if you Google it, it will <laughs> come up. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, if anything, I mean, if, if you're not Baha'i, it, 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 I don't think it matters because it, it is in play, just like the law of moderation is in play right now. And I think we've exceeded the bounds of moderation in terms of, uh, you know, maybe, you know, our, our, our abuse of our environment and things like that. So, um, so two sources, you can use the one you, you choose to believe in. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Stephen, for also providing the source for us in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, any other thoughts? Yes, uh, Aula stands for uh, we are just one planet and one human family. It's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if we uh, think like this, that we all belongs to one planet and we are actually members of one family so we must bring in, into life um, all the values for the unity of this uh, family 
to advance materially as well as spiritually. Hmm. Beautiful, thank you. And we have another question here from Joe. Oh, he's not, sorry. <laughs> All right, I think we're uh, currently um, done with the the whole part from from Nola and just want to give a little bit thought. OK, Joe, you want to say something? It's more like a question because um, at the beginning of this uh, this conversation, there was talk about all the examples of the United Nations and things. The Hopi prophecies talk about the House of Micah, which they interpret as the United Nations, and how that they've gone knocking at the doors of the United Nations on numerous occasions, and the first few times they were not even acknowledged. And then they eventually were welcomed in, and the United States kind of was um, not overly friendly towards their input. But as I understand it now, there's these initiatives coming from uh, legal people, i.e. corporations that uh, have been already already referenced earlier in this conversation of um, inf as I see it, infiltrating the, the United Nations and that changes uh, potentially changes the mission when you have legal people with agendas that are not necessarily uh, natural people friendly and so I, I consider that a big concern and question and I don't have the expertise to address that I thought I would bring it up and I'm sorry for the illusion about Pottersville, but the United States uh, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, um, uh, he goes back and, and everything becomes Pottersville. Old man Potter's a banker that wants to keep people living in slums for profit versus George Bailey, who wants to give out affordable mortgages. So that to me is, is part of the reality here. And, and a lot of that's been exported to around the world is kind of um, culture of greed. Thank you, Joe. And also, for Darren, okay, the, maybe I'll just give the, the last question here. Sure, I, and I, I, I don't know if there's much more time to talk about it, but I'd, I'd love to hear a few more thoughts from Nola um, about uh, how this fit in with the Baha'i community work. You started to mention something about junior youth and youth and so on. Um, like, I'm just wondering, is this something a procedure maybe we could try and follow in our area. This is a, a growth uh, sector in Calgary. Uh, we've got lots of junior youth and children's classes and so on. And uh, maybe talk a little bit more about how this works with the Baha'i community and the wider community. Okay, uh, the, well, I can tell you that the area teaching committee here is excited about these uh, conversation starters, these cards. And in terms of social action, there's also, there's, we have one of the members on our community that has uh, taken the junior youth, like a modified version of the junior youth program to one of the larger cities here, the city of York, and they are actually using it, um, not, and they're using it with at-risk youth. And so it, um, we're trying to find other, we have at-risk populations in our rural areas and what's one of our next actions is to see if we can offer the same program to those centers, those, those at-risk youth centers. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's not the full youth program, but it is the, the the principles of it, and it is being supported by the city of York there and uh, uh, here, and um, and it's they're being thanked. The community is being thanked for for making this available to them. So that's the thing. I think we need to work with our institutions. They need our help. They need, they're looking for guidance too. So I think we have to see ourselves as arm in arm with these institutions and um, basically offer assistance uh, in terms of the values that we uphold, which are that probably would align with theirs. And Very nice. I don't know if that yeah. answers the question. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Nola. And maybe if possible, could you share your email address uh, just in case everybody else from this round would like to get in uh, contact with Nola for some thoughts and exchange. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, please. Okay, so um, due to time, actually, uh, we do planned another uh, video you want to see and show, um, but um, we don't have enough time, but I will share that in the 
chat uh, for for the audiences themselves to dial in and take a look on the Vanuatu case um, that is um, released by the Baha'i World uh, Baha'i International um, Community. And now just use the last seven minutes, <laughs> maybe five to Philip, um, to give also another uh, report uh, from Geneva. Thank you, Nan. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Victoria couldn't be here today. Uh, she's under the weather. So I, I received a, a written report from uh, Switzerland. So they, in September uh, in Geneva, they had a, a meeting about attended by about 30 people. And uh, Arthur was part of that presentation. He did a presentation uh, as well as a Mr. Longuet. And from that, um, they decided to have a conversation, a community conversation using uh, Sarah Dehoff's material, and I, I can share what they what they did. I think maybe not. Uh, no, I don't think I can share it. Sorry. Anyway, they translated uh, Sarah Dehoff's material in in French, and they have also connected with uh, Dr. Marlene Sahakian at the. Uh, with the head of the sociology department at uh, Geneva University and is encouraging um, the two uh, protagonists here, Danielle and uh, Victoria, about participating in their project. And um, they have a um, uh, started reaching out to the community. They're, they're not quite as advanced as, as NOLA's community has, uh, but they, they've uh, started reaching out and they've found uh, two places where they can start di dialoguing with the local community at the grassroots. Um, and so tonight actually was uh, the time that they were meeting with uh, the head of a local social center about um, starting these conversations. So that's that's a very brief uh, over, uh, overview of what they've done, uh, but um, I think that the uh, I was happy that Nola was able to present her uh, the the project that her community has been involved with because they have uh, they're probably more advanced than any other grassroots project at this point, and um, her encouragement of engaging with. Uh, local community leaders seems to be the same pattern that is being adopted in in Switzerland in Geneva uh, Geneva as well. So um, that's basically where we are. We are just in, you know initiating community involvement. Um, my wife has been trying to get me to start something in our own neighborhood um, with elevated conversation based on the. GSA project materials and I, and so any uh, uh, experience that has been gained, such as uh, what is happening in Canada and Switzerland, is helpful in formulating steps for uh, for our own communities. And we in, encourage everyone to try to initiate um, activities in their own communities. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for the for the brief touch. Uh, what is happening there in Geneva and in the meantime I just saw that uh, yeah so Johan has also posted at uh, the link um, of uh, the video and film um, which is about 14 minutes long and feel free to uh, to take a look after the call and also share your thoughts in the mighty networks which also I posted in the link um, yeah beautiful so any other thoughts? Uh, I think Johan raised a hand. Yeah, Nan, just a question to the group. Um, if we were to have these calls just like today on a quarterly basis, is everybody uh, is everybody supportive of that? Or just say yes in the uh, chat room or just give a thumbs up? <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I think we've seen there's a lot of potential here. Uh, you know, this is these are ideas that people you know catch on to and want to take further and I think we've just started to plant seeds here 
But I think we need to water those seeds and encourage others to try things out and can keep sharing ideas that seem to be resonating with people and let the, let this sort of develop organically and go where it wants to grow. But you know, occasional meetings like that would allow us to share with each other and encourage each other going ahead. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Arthur. And uh, last but not least, I would like to also send invitation from EBBF to join us uh, for a live discussion in Lisbon Yay! in uh, May. So, which I will also uh, post. Maybe Daniel, you are the the, the best for that. For the for the invitation, yeah. <laughs> Could you post the link uh, in the chat? Exactly. So from the 18th to the 22nd in Lisbon, we had a wonderful uh, reunion last year. Um, beautiful weather, nice conversations, always great connections after the conference, uh, which motivates us also to stay more united and connected uh, along the months and years to generate more actions at uh, you know, local community level. Um, so yeah. Really looking forward to see uh, see you also joining uh, in Lisbon and to have the the bigger reunion and celebrations and reflections uh, of the year actions taken in the EBBF members. Okay, any other thoughts? <laughs> like any of you not already involved in the project, please join us. You know. And tell your friends who might be interested as well. We're looking for we need to recruit more people to take this further. We're not very many now, but uh, you know the more we can get on board, the more we can develop some momentum. So thank you very much for joining. Yes. Thank you. And with that said, I wish you all the best and have a great start of the new year. Yes, and also yes, the Chinese New Year is happening as, at the moment <laughs> for someone who is celebrating Happy New Year of the Year of Rabbit. And we are looking forward. Xinyanquala, yes. <laughs> We're looking forward to you having this dialogue again in uh, three months of time. So stick. Bye.